Uh, I'm Anthony Pearl, a professor in the program who's on uh, uh, study leave this term, and it's been uh, a fun treat to be here today. And it's an even greater pleasure to uh, introduce the uh, grand finale of today's uh, events, uh, uh, Ken Cameron, my colleague who's uh, adjunct professor in, uh, in urban studies. Um, Ken uh, probably needs no introduction. He's been mentioned a few times already uh, today when people have been talking about the regional vision uh, for uh, uh, the Lower Mainland and the Livable Region Strategic Plan, which he had a big part in uh, pulling together. Uh, Ken has uh, played many roles, uh, important roles uh, in our region, working for uh, the GVRD, uh, being uh, Chief Executive of the Homeowners Protection Office uh, here in British Columbia. Um, and maybe uh, uh, for this uh, event, importantly, being the first uh, chair of the Advisory Council for the Urban Studies Program at SFU. And uh, uh, Ken um, has worked uh, uh, closely with uh, many noted urbanists uh, in the region, but one in particular, I think one of his old uh, uh, teachers, uh, Peter Oberlander uh, at uh, UBC at the time, um, is someone who uh, Ken is now uh, channeling uh, to uh, write uh, a biography, which he's going to read uh, uh, some excerpts uh, from uh, to get us uh, thinking uh, uh, about the region uh, in, fin in uh, this final session. So, Ken, thanks for joining us, and let's welcome him. Well, thank thanks, Anthony, and uh, I uh, loved Peter dear dearly, but the thought of channeling him, I think, is uh, more than even I can stand. Um, but he was a man with a great many uh, uh, positive features and challenges. And I know this has been a long day, uh, and I don't want to take um, too much of your time with sharing with you some of the work that I'm doing, uh, because I know that uh, you have other things you want to do with your weekend. Um, I'm working on this. This is not a biography of Peter Oberlander that I'm doing, uh, but a little bit more than that. He was a pioneer in Canadian planning and in planning for the Lower Mainland. He founded the School of Community and Regional Planning at UBC, and he served as the Deputy Minister or Secretary of the Minister of Ministry of Urban Affairs in the Pierre Trudeau government. He was a key influence in the creation of the United Nations Program on Human Settlements, also known as Habitat, and he served for 10 years as a Citizenship Court Judge. It was my privilege to be associated with him initially as a student at UBC and then later in a variety of roles as my career unfolded. The most important thing he instilled in me, and I think we heard a lot about it today, was the concept of citizenship as a set of rights and responsibilities that we all have at the local, national and international levels. And this concept of citizenship infused everything Peter did as a planner, an academic, a public servant, and even as a parent. So at the time of his death, I reflected on this theme of citizenship and how it developed in the 20th century and how that paralleled uh, uh, Peter's life experience. The term citizenship meant practically nothing in the ruins of Europe after World War I when Peter was born. The family's life and identity and citizenship were stripped away by the Nazi takeover of their native Austria in 1938 and Peter in particular was harshly treated by the British and Canadian governments. He arrived as an, in Canada as an internee, as an enemy alien uh, in 1940. And he spent a year, his first year in Canada, in prison camps in British Columbia, in New Brunswick and Quebec. So the working title of the book is Global Citizenship, Peter Oberlander and one of the great ideas of the 20th century. That idea being the concept of citizenship as we know it today and how we experience it as Canadians and as citizens of other countries around the world. The excerpt I'm going to read tonight, and it's very brief, deals with Peter's role in bringing regional planning to the Lower Mainland through the Lower Mainland Regional Planning Board. And you've heard some of the earlier parts of this story earlier today. It was an activity that he undertook while just getting established at UBC as a faculty member and as the head of the planning school. And it shows the flair for multitasking uh, that is the hallmark of any good citizen. So it was a sudden crisis generated by the Fraser River floods in the spring of 1948 that eventually made regional planning 
in the lower mainland are reality. The flood was the result of unusually hot weather in British Columbia that led to a high snowmelt in the interior. As a result, the Agassiz Dyke gave way on May 26th. In a short term time, a large areas of the lower mainland were inundated and the provincial government had to respond to the most, quote, the most destructive natural disaster in Canadian history. On May 31st, Premier Brian, Byron Johnson declared a state of emergency. Peter later recalled how the Fraser River flood destroyed farmlands, houses, buildings, communities, and literally washed millions of acres of farmlands down the river. This natural catastrophe, however, created two planning-related opportunities, and it's always intrigued me how uh, planning and disaster often kind of go to hand in hand, and how the function of government, the first function of government is to protect the citizen uh, from danger, and planning is an important part of that, which we often forget. So first, the flood compelled the 26 local governments in the region to re get, get serious about a regional approach to planning that would, among other things, discourage area, a settlement in areas that were vulnerable to flooding and other natural hazards. Second, the flood established the need to build dikes to regulate the river and to control its flooding. You'll see me, I'm going through pages of my book here at a great rate for your, for your benefit. As a consultant, this led to the creation of the Lower Mainland Regional Planning Board. And as a consultant to the board, Peter had responsibility for shortlisting candidates for the position of executive director. He especially recommended Jim, James W. Wilson, a, a Scottish engineer uh, trained in Glasgow and at the Massachusetts in Institute of Technology. The board accepted this recommendation and with the executive director in place, the Lower Mainland Regional Planning Board's office was located in New Westminster at 4, 4, 426 Columbia Street uh, uh, with a basic staff of a geographer, a political scientist, two draftsmen, and one stenographer with Jim Wilson doubling up as the treasurer. The financing of the, plan, of, of the Regional Planning Board, quote, as Peter said, it happened at the Minister of Municipal Affairs shoe store in New Westminster on Saturday mornings. Jim and Peter would go to, on the trolley, come on the trolley to New Westminster and confront the minister behind the cash register. <laughs> that is where we would settle the budget for the first year and ultimately Jim and Peter convinced the minister to allow the Lower Mainland Regional Planning Board to receive from the municipalities two cents a head uh, as a contribution to the budget of the Lower Mainland Regional Planning Board. In the coming years, the Lower Mainland Regional Planning Board produced ideas, reports, studies on all aspects of life in the region, culminating, as you've heard, in an official regional plan in 1966, which was formally adopted by the Lower Mainland Plan Regional Planning Board, the municipalities, and the province of British Columbia. Its central theme, cities in a sea of green, well-planned communities in a working landscape and farm, a farm and forest, has dominated regional planning thought and development to this day. So, the legacy of Canada's first regional plan is the region of Greater Vancouver that we know today. A firm line between city and countryside, an outstanding system of regional parks, and limited settlements in areas subject to flooding and other hazards. So here endeth the lesson. I, in conclusion, I just want to say I think it's very fitting that we end our day considering regionalism here, just a few blocks from that shoe store and contemplating the forward-thinking work conducted here more than 65 years ago. It's a reminder that we're all part of an ongoing process and that we have a responsibility to those who came before us as well as to those who will come after us to protect and enhance one of the most beautiful and livable places in the world. Thank you.